Good morning, everyone. Happy Earth Day. You know, a few years ago, when I was working uh, with UNESCO, they decided that they would have an international day for teachers because education was important. And I thought to myself, how crazy. Education is important 365 days a year. What have we come to if we have to remind everybody once a year that education is important? And now look at, we have to worry about the Earth just one day a year. I think it's a much longer commitment. So happy Earth Day all year. This uh, town hall meeting is about our budget, and I wanted to start off a little bit by reminding you of how we got to where we are. Uh, earlier this fall, we started off with some meetings and telling people that there were some uncertainties this year, things that we didn't know. Um, we didn't know what the government was going to do We'd, about funding. We didn't know what would happen with the tuition. We didn't know what would happen with pensions. Um, with that in mind, we said to everybody, well, there's no point in coming out with the full budget until we hear from the government. But in the meantime, we have to get ready. And when you think about it, what would be the worst case scenario? So we told everybody, well, why don't we do a double budget? A budget as if it was status quo, and a budget as if it was cut. And we asked all of the deans and the department chairs and everybody to work and come up with two possible budgets so that we could, once, once things were announced, act quickly and come to a budget conclusion. And the good news is that, that it's not as bad as it could have been. But the bad news is that it isn't great and perfect. Um, but I know that Carleton University has come so far over the years. I think about it, we started in the basement of a school um, people were, were, were meeting together in the community to form this school. We now have a beautiful campus. We do have some wonderful facilities. Not enough, not good enough, but we have great facilities. And we have a wonderful faculty and staff and really good students. So we can work really closely together. We are not as badly off as a lot of other universities. But we're in a situation where we're a little bit coming from behind. All of you know that we're trying to make our reputation catch up with us. All of you know that we are getting greater every day. The other universities, their reputation is up there. And they are cutting and losing every day. If we can hold together and work together, we can make Carlton succeed in this hard time. We can make it that we're the star that rises when the others are falling out of the sky. So this really is an opportunity for us to stay together, um, work together really hard, and make good things happen. So why are we in this good estate? Well, part of it is that, that we've had good financial planning in the past. And that good financial planning has been done by an administration that led led by Duncan Watt, and he's going to talk you through where we are now. There's some really tough decisions that we're going to have to make, but we'll make them together, and whatever we decide, this university will be good, we will continue, and we will work for the future. The other thing that I'm going to say to you is that some people have come up to me and said, why don't you go out and borrow money? Why don't you just paper over anything that's bad now, and let the people in the next generation suffer for it. That is not an appropriate thing to do. We're about sustainability. We are an education institution that is about the future. We are working for the future. I don't think any of you would want to have your name on the wall saying, this person contributed to the suffering of the next generation. Let's solve the problems today and be sure that this university continues strong every day in the future. So with that, um, Duncan Watt. Do you want this on? There we go. There we go. 
Uh, so I have a, a PowerPoint presentation I'm going to go through, and uh, as Roseanne said, is what I would uh, like to accomplish at the end of it is, is give you a sense of uh, what are the drivers of our financial affairs and what are the uh, key issues that we're facing today. Um, so for those of you who attended the last town hall we meeting we had uh, last June, uh, University Finance 101 hasn't changed very much, but it's just a reminder about uh, what are the key issues for us on both our revenue and expenditure side of the university. A lot of our financial affairs are controlled by the provincial government, uh, so the March 25th provincial budget was a very important day for us, so I'll tell you what uh, they told us. Uh, our challenges and opportunities and where we're going from here, and at the end there will be uh, lots of time for questions if you have any. The um, presentation is being taped, so if you have trouble sleeping, you'll be able to watch it online in the future. And I think the overheads uh, will be on my website uh, this afternoon. Okay. Uh, this is a snapshot of the, uh, the university as a financial uh, institution. Uh, I'm not sure what we are. We're uh, probably a medium-sized business, so on the... Uh, Left side of the screen is our uh, sort of the amount of money we spend on an annual basis. Uh, the one at the bottom, capital, varies a little bit. It's a little higher now than it would have been last year because of the new buildings that are underway. And on the investment side, this is the money that uh, we invest um, pension funds, so we uh, maintain our commitment to all of us and retirees as their pension uh, promise and the endowment fund, the money we've got for donors, which mainly is spent today on student aid. But, uh, where do we get our money from? Well, we get our money from, uh, about half of our money comes from tuition fees and miscellaneous fees, so that's obviously directly uh, based on the number of students who are at the university. And the other half of the money comes from a government grant, which is also based on the number of students at the university, so the way they Ontario grant system works. There's a uh, basic income unit generated for different types of students and uh, they uh, fund us based on the number of students that are here. So what uh, we all need to remember, all of us who work at the universities, we're here because of students and we get paid because we have students at the university. And how do we spend our money? Uh, well, 75% of our money we spend on people. That's uh, salaries and benefits. Uh, the pie chart uh, that's grown the most in the last year is the called employer pension contributions. Uh, so if you remember back to June 25th last year, that pie chart we had about $11 million in it. So this is the big change that's happening in our life and I'll talk a fair bit today about our pension plan and the uh, challenges that it's creating for us. It's probably not surprising in the... Um, being in the nature of an academic institution, uh, that we spend most of our money on people. Uh, that, that's a reality. It's the same at Carleton and every Ontario university. Uh, the bad part of that is, is though if we have to shrink our budgets, it actually ultimately ends up affecting individuals, right? And that's a, an unfortunate reality for us. This is a bit of a snapshot going back uh, over a number of years. Um, so there's three parts I'd like you to illustrate. So in the mid-90s, uh, you can see that the uh, red bars, which is the amount of money we're spending each year, was a little higher than the blue bars, our annual income. So Carleton found itself in the mid-90s with uh, what we would call a structural deficit. Uh, it's a situation being faced today by many Ontario universities that are going through very significant cuts. Uh, we landed there in the mid-90s because for two reasons. Um, first, our undergraduate enrollment changed dramatically. In 93-94, uh, we brought in like 6,300 first-year students. By 96-97, we were bringing in 3,700 first-year students. So that dropped our income. Combined was this is when the Harris government was elected and they were reducing grants to universities. So for those of you that were here in the 96-97-98, uh, we went through a sort of a drastic uh, restructuring where we paid about $30 million to have 15 to 20% of our faculty and staff leave the university. 
that was actually absolutely necessary for our financial health. Um, now I'm pleased to say that's not where we're at today. Uh, if you uh, get out towards the end here, uh, 2010-11, uh, I would say our financial affairs are still uh, very much in control. But if you look around the Ontario system, probably including down the canal, there's probably two-thirds of the Ontario universities today are where we were at in the mid-90s. In the interim period of uh, 2002 to 2007 was the double cohort period, so Carleton and all Ontario universities went through a dramatic expansion. When we came out of the double cohort, our uh, number of undergraduate students started to level off. And there you can see in uh, 2006, 7, 8, 9, our income was leveled off as well. This year, or for next year, for next year already, 2010, 11, you'll see our income has perked up. And that's absolutely entirely due to the fact that we're growing the number of undergraduate students at the university, right? So if there's, I may repeat this a few times today, if there's something you want to remember, well, I don't know. Well, I'd like you to remember many things, but one thing is undergraduate students are the economic engine of uh, Carleton University and every other university in Ontario. It's on the revenue side of our budgets, um, we control the uh, number of students at some level, undergraduate, masters and PhD students. Uh, the government controls the amount of money we get for each of those students, tuition fees and a government grant. A recent change in the Ontario University system has been that the uh, government provides a target for every university uh, for the number of PhD students and master's students that they will fund up to and a separate envelope for funding undergraduate students. So we pay a lot of attention today to trying to forecast the number of undergrads, masters, and PhD students at the university. On the expenditure side, well, so if I go back up, so the, from the revenue side then, we have like partial control of the revenue that comes into the university. On the expenditure side, in a general sense, we have total control over it. Uh, the two key things we're facing with there today are our pension plan. Uh, it's without a doubt our biggest financial liability today. Uh, no one's going to find a solution to this problem for us, so we have to work very hard at Carleton to find a solution for our pension problem, which I'm confident that we will do. Salary growth in the Ontario University system at Carleton for the last five years, salaries have gone up on average about 5% a year. Faculty a little more, staff a little less. It's a salary growth that we absolutely will not be able to afford going forward, right? So this is a major challenge for us. So just uh, to spend a minute on this, uh, the bottom line, the blue line is the, uh, the path we've had for undergraduate students. So if you go back to the mid-90s, you'll see where we were at just over 6,000 students. We dropped down to just under 4,000. Uh, since the double cohort has gone through, we've had a uh, plan which we've achieved of growing our first-year students by about 2% a year, 2 to 3% a year. Um, that's the plan we have going forward. It's going to be challenging for us because of the demographics of uh, high school students. The number of high school, we get half of our uh, first-year class comes from Ottawa. The number of high school students Graduating in Ottawa is going to start to decline in the next five years. Um, now offsetting that, there's growth in the GTA where we get 20% of our students. Um, the, but we, we're, well, anyway, so the conclusion is we need to work hard to achieve this 2% growth. Offsetting the demographics, to where I was going, offsetting the demographics is the fact that there's more high school students electing each year to go to university versus college or directly into the workforce. So we're reasonably confident that we can achieve these targets. With that modest first year growth, uh, because we've had that in uh, each of the last three years, we have a fairly significant uptick in the total number of undergraduate students here. Absolutely essential for our financial health that we're able to achieve these uh, recruitment targets that we have in this model. 
On the uh, graduate student side, we've had some uh, very good news this year. Uh, we have been struggling to achieve the master's target, which is the black line at the top that the province set for us four years ago. Uh, whereas we've been able to actually have a few more PhD students than they were funding. So this year, we're in uh, February, the government agreed to uh, trade uh, two for one, some master's positions for funded uh, PhD students, so that was good news for us. It doesn't do anything at all for our financial affairs of the university. Uh, we are uh, allocating today to attract a new graduate student all of the net new revenue we're getting associated with that graduate student. But clearly it is very good for the research enterprise and for the reputation of the university. So, so that, that finishes Finance 101. Um, switching off to what was in the university budget or the provincial budget and what it means for us. Um, the two-year tuition fee framework of uh, tuition fees can go up no more than 5% per year. Uh, we were somewhat surprised by this. We thought there would be a one-year tuition fee framework uh, because there's going to be an election in Ontario in the fall of 2011. We thought there would be a pre-election announcement, but uh, this actually spans the next provincial election, which we found surprising. Also a requirement uh, that we reinvest 10% of the new tuition revenue into student aid. Uh, that's something the government had placed in the uh, four or five years ago, but we haven't uh, had that recently. Full base funding for undergraduate enrollment as of last year. So that's a big change. Um, in my time in Ontario, there's been three times where the government's actually provided a full grant for the undergraduate students that are in the system. Early 90s, 2004-05 after the double cohort, and again in 2009 and 10. So this was a big surprise for us that they decided to do this. Previously, what was in our model was that we were going to get 50 cents on the dollar for a government grant for our growth since 0405. So that's very positive news for us. Something that we were not expecting in the budget speech was the uh, Wage Restraint Act, uh, which freezes compensation levels for non-unionized employees for two years, uh, with the recommendation that we work with all of our employee groups to uh, freeze their compensation levels as well. So it's not a wage freeze. What compensation levels means, as it turns out, um, is that if uh, that progress through the ranks or CDIs, uh, career development increments, are permitted. Uh, so if you had a, uh, an employee whose salary was fifty to $70,000 and they're currently at $60,000 and normally their salary would go up by 2% uh, per year, well then that 2% is permitted. It's the scale increases that they uh, are not allowed for uh, out of scope employees. And the big one that we did not receive was, and I'm going to talk more about pensions, but was solvency relief for our pension plan. Uh, we, it's a bit of a surprise to us. We thought that we had uh, negotiated a framework with the province. These are all Ontario universities that would allow them to provide solvency relief, but uh, they did not do that. Uh, the president and I were at a meeting in Toronto on Monday having further discussions with the government about that, and uh, it, it's hard to, know with this kind of, hard to know what the government's really thinking, but I think it's highly unlikely that this is going to happen, though it might. So let's talk a little bit more about the pension plan. So we are under provincial uh, pension legislation. Every three years we need to file evaluation of our plan. Two tests are done. The first is a solvency test. Uh, the assumption is, is that your plan is wound up and you have enough money in your plan to meet your uh, obligations to retirees and for whatever pension individuals who are still working have accumulated to that date. This is the one that we're trying to get out from under because we think it's a, not a realistic uh, proposition that any Ontario university is going to close its doors. Um, so far we've not been successful, as I've said, in doing that. Um, the second test is a going concern, which uh, we and all Ontario universities are fully committed to funding, is on the assumption that your pension plan continues forever and you have enough money in your plan to meet that obligation. Our next valuation is July 1st. Uh, at that time, our actuaries are forecasting we're going to have the 
69 and 62 million dollar uh, deficit um, in both of those plans. One piece of pension legislation that was changed last fall was with member consent, so that would be you and retirees. Uh, we can change the payback period for solvency payments from five to 10 years. So what will happen is we will do evaluation on July 1st. It'll take the actuaries three or four months to do that. And then we will be going out to members and asking for your uh, consent that we can change the amortization period from five to 10 years for the solvency payments. If we're successful in doing that, the estimate is, is that our extraordinary payments that we'll need to make to the pension plan or special payments is a $15 million in 2011-12, going up to $24 million in the following year and continuing on for the next 10 years. Now these will not be the right numbers. These are numbers the actuaries have generated based on assumptions that long-term interest rates do not change and that our pension plan performance meets the actuarial assumption in the plan, which is 6.5% per year. Well, long-term interest rates will change. They'll go up or down, and plan performance will be something different than 6.5%. Um, but there's nothing that would lead a reasonable individual to think that we're not going to be making very significant extraordinary payments to the plan in 1112 12 and 12-13. 12 so this has become sort of a key element of our planning is to finally now facing this and say, okay, we're going to have to pay this money. Uh, and we're going to have to pay it on an ongoing basis. It's not a one-off payment. We do have, because we've been watching our pension plan since the market crash, the high-tech crash in the early 2000s, you may recall that we do have $15 million of one-time money set aside to deal with the 11-12 payment. Uh, but at this point, we don't have any money to set aside for the 1213 going forward payment. Uh, so, what are our assumptions as we move forward? Um, one key assumption is, is that our retention rates are not going to improve. Uh, hopefully, they will. This is an opportunity, and I know that uh, the provost and the deans are working hard on doing this. Um, it is an opportunity for us. Our retention rates are actually about the Ontario average, so they're, they're okay at that level. But there are a couple of Ontario universities that have the same high school entry averages as us whose retention rates are about two percentage points higher. Um, and if we could improve our retention rates by 1%, that would add about $2.6 million to our operating budget. So it's, it's a big deal, right? It doesn't sound like a lot to actually save one more student, but uh, it uh, would have a big impact and it is an opportunity for us. We will increase uh, undergraduate tuition fees by the maximum allowed. Um, we know that's 5% per year on average for the next two years. That we will achieve these undergraduate enrollment uh, targets that we've set for ourselves. And it's not perfectly clear, but we think in 2010-11, the government is going to give us grant support for undergraduate and graduate growth as well. So we've built that into our model as well. On the expenditure side, uh, to make all of this work, uh, we are, what the board approved earlier this week was a $5.1 million reduction in uh, budgets to resource planning committees. And what comes out of the model is, is that we'll need to continue to reduce our budget by approximately $2.6 million per year going forward. What this means for people is actually there are about 21 positions being eliminated in uh, this budget exercise. Four positions are uh, staff people that were actually in their positions, and so those four individuals received redundancy letters earlier this week. Uh, the remaining 17 positions are people who are, they're either vacant positions or they're individuals who are on long-term disability, right? And so we're not, uh, we think it's unlikely that they'll come back to the workplace. We are also making the assumption that uh, we will conform with the Wage Restraint Act as we go through collective bargaining with all of our major unions in the next six months. Uh, don't know for sure that's going to happen, but that's the assumption we have in our model. 
that we are going to make these $24 million payments uh, for a number of years starting in 1213. We have also set aside $1 million of base money and some additional fiscal money in each of the future budget years to deal with, uh, you know, I don't call it mission critical activities or new academic initiatives. I think we need to continue to evolve uh, to do new and different things even though we're in this challenging financial position. And that the uh, budget model we put in uh, earlier this year where we flow 40% of net tuition revenue associated with undergraduate growth directly to the teaching faculties that will continue to do that. Now one of the outcomes of uh, this uh, enrollment link budget allocation model in this budget process is a differential treatment of how different uh, budget units at the university have been treated. So because the teaching faculties actually have an opportunity to generate revenue through this model, uh, there are three of our faculties, uh, engineering, Sprott, and science, who had about 9% growth in their undergraduate students last year. So the new money they're getting out of the ELBA model pretty much totally offsets their budget cut. Uh, public Affairs and FAST grew about 3%, so it mitigates their budget cut but doesn't get rid of it. So the results in the units that are actually bearing the brunt of the budget cut are the support units that report to the president or one of the three vice presidents. Or the library is on that list too. Yeah. So I, I think the ELBA, ELBA, ELBA is the acronym for Enrollment Link Budget Allocation, I think is an excellent idea. Um, but it has actually resulted in this process that we're going through now of reducing budgets of uh, very different treatment amongst budget units. This maybe looks a little complicated, but it's our um, plan for how we're going to uh, find the $24 million to uh, fix, the budget pro fix the pension problem going forward. Let me try this out here. Uh, so below the line is the money that we're setting aside in each of the budget years. Uh, this, uh, whatever color that might be, is base money and that is fiscal money. Uh, so for this year and next year, we're going to set a fair bit amount of base and fiscal money to deal with the pension problem. And the top of the line is the payments that we need to make. Uh, the $15 million payment, it's a different color because we have that $15 million set aside already. Uh, the $24 million payment in 1213 is partially base money and partially fiscal money. Uh, we'll add $3 million of base money to sort of the pension reserve fund in each of the seven years. So when we get out to the end of the model in 2016 and 17, we actually have the uh, $24 million of base money set aside. So I think at one level the model's fine. I think it demonstrates that we're making progress towards dealing with this plan. It, to be honest, it gets a little uh, flexible, wonky after 2011-12. 2011 uh, 11-12 is the last year we know what the tuition fee framework is and we know what the government grant structure is. So I think these numbers are very solid for this year, this year being 2010-11 and 11-12. Uh, but we'll have to revise the model every year. But, uh, but in the revision, we're still, unless something dramatically changes to lead us to conclude that the $24 million is the wrong number, we will just uh, keep working with this model of setting, setting some base and some fiscal so we have enough money to deal with the problem. So, that's the last overhead. Uh, sort of communication. So I think in this uh, difficult times we're in uh, that it, uh, we will try and communicate more often uh, and more frequently. If any of you are interested in having us come and talk to your uh, staff meetings, we'd be pleased to come and do that. If you want to hear of other questions about the budget, we'd be glad to do that. Uh, the enrollment linked uh, resource allocation model, I think it's worked very well for us, uh, but we'll continue to work with the deans to refine that model over the next period. Even though I have this nice graph that indicated the previous one says that we have a solution to our pension problem, well, we really don't have a solution to our pension problem. Uh, 
So we need to work within the community to find a, a good long time solution for it. We launched the Task Force on Financial Resources last uh, summer. Um, we're still open for business. Uh, the mandate of the task force is to look for new re revenue generation or to eliminate waste cost reduction. Uh, the task force had 45 submissions. Um, we funded a number of projects. Uh, the biggest project we funded is uh, $200,000 for distance and flexible learning, which we think will generate $1.8 million in new revenue. So I would strongly encourage any of you out there that have any ideas, big or small, please send them into the task force. And just to illustrate the last point, uh, I've talked about it already. Our meeting our undergraduate recruitment targets is essential to our financial health. And anything we can do to improve retention of students, it's really no issue at all for graduate students, but for undergraduate students will be uh, very good for all kinds of reasons. Be good in terms of helping the student be successful, but it's also very good for the financial health of the university as well. So with that, I think we're at questions, if there are any.